So first, I want to thank very much uh, Stockton and Active Minds for having me here. It's a amazing to be able to be at the space where I can present my story and provide information to people who I very much resonate with where I've been um, in my life and be able to kind of pass on um, that information now. So thank you very much, Julie, Nate, Active Minds, everyone at Stockton that's involved. It really means a lot to, to be here and to be speaking. So to tell you my story, we really need to kind of go a little bit back in time. And by a little, I mean essentially to the beginning <laughs> for me not like that far back. Uh, so I was born um, four months early. So my mom, um, if she didn't already have some level of anxiety, she was a little bit anxious about that notion because I was one pound, <coughs> 10 ounces. And so uh, things were a little bit uh, uncertain in the beginning. It was definitely a little bit unclear of my survival. I was stuck in a plastic bubble of an incubator and uh, on a lot of medical equipment. So things were a little uneasy. And for my mom who had anxiety and my dad who didn't really express a lot of emotion, it was a little bit of a difficult time. Now that on top of the fact that my brother had been born prior, he was normal, he was healthy, three years older than me. Um, but before my brother, they had lost another little girl. So on the heels of all of that, there I come, four months early, I was raring and ready to go. I didn't need any more time. Um, However, my body wasn't physically able to keep up. So the first time my dad saw me, um, I was restrained with my arms stretched out like this with galls around my wrists. Galls were strong enough to hold down my arms. And my dad was like, she's the only baby in the NICU that is restrained. Like, why is my daughter restrained? And the doctor was like, oh, well, she's a fighter. <laughs> He's like, it's a good thing. It'll probably help her to stay alive. However, for her right now, she's been yanking out all the medical equipment that's trying to keep her living. And so for her own safety, we had to restrain her. So that was not even an hour into my life in this world. And so I am a fighter, <laughs> fairly stubborn. You can ask most people that know me and that's pretty accurate. That hasn't changed at all. But I like to think that it's attributed to my uh, survival to this point, so that's pretty cool. So uh, when I finally went home, which was about normal term, about four months later, uh, I went home to 40 acres of property in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. Literally, like the town I lived in had no street lights. There were only stop signs. There were more cows and trees than there were people. And uh, this is where I grew up, <laughs> out in nature, which was lovely, um, but just kind of set the scene for you. So in my childhood, as I was growing up, there were a few important things that I learned about myself <coughs> that uh, influenced my story. So one of the things that I learned um, first, now not consciously understood at the time, right? this um, information that I kind of gleaned and have understood came later in life, but one of the things that I understood is that, well, I knew I was a girl, and being a girl, I started to understand in my family that meant that I was inferior or less than boys and men. Now this wasn't like an implicitly taught lesson, right? My parents weren't like, you're less than your brother. You're not as good as boys. Um, but it was something that I just started to understand. I saw the way that my parents interacted. I saw the way that um, my friends' parents interacted, who made the decisions, who didn't. And uh, I was observing. I was very um, aware of my surroundings and what was happening. And so the lessons that I took away were that myself in this body as I was, was not as significant as if I had been born a boy. And so that really stuck with me. You know, I understood with that awareness that then I was just automatically uh, less than. So here I was, came into the world and like already a match down. Now, um, the other lesson that I understood about myself really wasn't something that I had gleaned from the world, but that was really explicitly told to me and that was that I was sensitive. Now, this came in, in many different forms, but primarily like, oh, Corinne, you're so sensitive. Why are you so sensitive? Like, stop being so sensitive. And I didn't really even understand what people were communicating. I didn't put really two and two together until later in life, but <coughs> I began to understand that what they were saying is that I was too easily impacted by the world around me. I was too emotionally volatile. I was too, I felt too much, right? My emotions were too big and too strong. And what I did understand from that is that when I would walk into a room 
and say there were you know a couple people in there and maybe they had been arguing or something but now it looked like things were cool like it would feel weird right it would feel like there was something going on that no one was talking about and it was kind of awkward except everyone seemed to think like it was cool <laughs> And so it was a little confusing because I'd be like, oh, like, what's up? What's going on? And everyone would be like, nothing. So I was like, okay. And then I'd ask one of my friends, you know, who clearly looked to me like she was really struggling or really having a hard time. And I'd be like, hey, like, how are you? She'd be like, oh, I'm good. Things are good. It's great. I'm fine. I'm like, no, you're not. That's not true. Like, it's obviously not true. And um, she was like, no, yeah, it's good. I'm fine. But to me, like I could see, right? I could feel and sense underneath there, like she was not telling me the truth. But yet, constantly getting this information, right, that I was sensitive and that what I was perceiving was inaccurate, made me start to question things. And again, right, this wasn't a conscious questioning, it was just kind of a natural deduction that I had come to. And so what I deduced from all of that was that I was wrong. Right, how I was perceiving the world, how I was reading people, how I was understanding things was just completely off base. Because I really couldn't imagine that like my friends, right, my family members, the people closest to me wouldn't be open, right? They wouldn't be telling me the truth, they wouldn't be, you know, kind of realistic with me. And so I was like, Oh, well, it must be me, right? The whole entire world as I knew the world, right, couldn't be <laughs> wrong or off or not aware, maybe. Right? Like I couldn't fathom that. And so what I deduced there, right, was that, oh, everyone was accurate, right? It was me. There was definitely something wrong because I was just constantly <laughs> incorrect. And so I had this combination, right, of not enough as a girl and on top of being too much emotionally, which was really kind of difficult. And when I um, was in these really emotional periods, my parents, I would get in trouble. Right? I would be sent to my room for a timeout. I needed to get myself together, um, or I would get spanked. It wasn't abusive, right? There wasn't that big of a scenario around these emotional occurrences, but it was very negative, right? It was very punishment oriented, and so that like reinforced what I was learning. Like, oh, this is a really bad thing. I would get sent to my room for time to calm down. However, I was in such an emotional place that like. I didn't know how to calm down, right? I was in like early adolescence at this point. Like I had no emotional regulation or management skills. It's not like they talked about it in school then. They're getting better with it now, right? <coughs> but I, I didn't know what to do with that. And so um, I remember one instance, I, I may have been around 12, where, do you remember? Well, they still exist, but like those little tiny glass figurines of like animals and things, right, that they would sell. I had them in my room and I loved them. Oh. They were wonderful. I had this one giraffe, which the giraffe was very delicate, right? This tiny little stick of a thing. And I remember picking it up and I threw it. I was pissed. Oh, I was so angry. And then you know what happened? It broke. Oh, I remember that it broke. And even though for the instant that I had thrown it and I felt that, you know, that bit of relief and then like the dread that follows sometimes, Oh, that's what happened. And I was in this relief, and then the dread swallowed me up. If I hadn't been overly emotional, if I hadn't been so sensitive, I wouldn't have gotten sent to my room. If I hadn't been sent to my room, I wouldn't have gotten angry. And then if I hadn't gotten angry, I wouldn't have thrown the draft, and I wouldn't have thrown the draft, and I wouldn't have even gotten more angry, and then more disappointed in myself. And it was this cycle that had developed where, oh, I was swallowed up in. It wasn't maybe yet self-hatred, but just immense amounts of discontent. How did I get to be this way? I was a kid. What was wrong with me? Why was I in this state and so messed up? And so one of the other things that I recognized in being sent to my room is that my parents weren't capable of managing me. I understood that they did not know what to do. At least that's how it was interpreted to me. And I did notice my mom's anxiety, like I mentioned earlier, and how it fueled her behavior, right? I could watch how it influenced her doing certain things, and I was like, ooh, right? Or my dad's inability to express emotion and his anger. I could tell how it fueled his interactions with people and his communication or his vulnerability or lack of. And so my awareness, right, my sensitivity, like that perception I had of things, 
was a little bit de detrimental for me initially because I could tell my parents didn't know really how to help me. They didn't have the skill set to support me in the realm of emotion. And so I also surmised, right, like, oh, well, I'm doing this on my own then at 12. Okay, great. And my friends and my family, right, who I imagined I would re be relying on, I couldn't, I couldn't rely on them because when I asked them what was up and what was going on, they weren't honest with me from what I saw from how they felt or what I felt from how <coughs> they felt, right? And so I was like, well, <laughs> I've got no one, but here we go. So all of this, right, that cycle that I had described to you and being in this emotional overwhelm, it only escalated because the notion as I had it is that you change yourself through punishment, right? Like, I did something wrong, I got punished for it, and therefore, the natural progression for change and improvement is punishment. And, you know, it wasn't severe. We weren't abused growing up. We were spanked a couple of times, yelled at, right, put in time out. It wasn't this overly huge, really, um, you know, uh, relationship or dynamic. And so, from that, right, I went into more punishment. When I was emotional, right, or when I was over the top, or when I wasn't how I was supposed to be, I started taking it out on my own body. Now, I didn't recognize and have the words at the time of self-harm, but you name it, right, like that's where I dove into because my body, I was so angry with it, right? Like if I hadn't been a girl, if I wasn't feeling so much, if I wasn't so sensitive, this was the problem, right? This was the issue, and so if I could change it, right, I could be this person that I wanted to be. I didn't want to be disliked by my peers, right? I didn't want to be frustrating my parents or making people feel like they had to like get away from me or leave me alone because I was like a little bit too much. You know, I wanted to be um, someone that people that wanted to be around, right? So self-harm developed and I was looking for a way to change, right? I was looking for something to help me improve upon myself and my very poor plight that it seemed like I had. And thankfully, thankfully, I had um, Shape, Self, and Seventeen magazines, very helpful references. I had my mom's um, uh, input, not directly, but of her talking negatively about her body, needing to change her body, needing for it to be different than what it was. I saw her going to Weight Watchers meetings and eating different foods than what she would serve the rest of us. And so I was like, oh, I have the answer, right? This is it, this is it. All the supporting evidence points to change my body, change my life. And so I was off, right? You heard I was determined from the beginning. I'm not gonna half-ass anything. I'm gonna go all in. And so I started cutting out all the articles around exercise and changing my body, and I organized them nicely in a folder, which I kept tucked away secretively, and at night, I would, after everyone thought I was in bed, right, I'd start exercising because I was certainly going to change. I don't know what it was going to take, but I was going to do it. So I started exercising, but I didn't really see the results I was looking for. Like, yeah, maybe my body changed a bit, but I really wanted, like, lasting, consistent change. And so when that didn't work, I started understanding, right, food equated to the equation, too. And so, like, well, let me, you know, let me just start restricting. And I could easily cut out breakfast now in high school. No one was awake, right? I could just do my own thing, go to school at lunch, be like, oh, I forgot my lunch money. Dinner would be like, oh, I'm eating with friends. And my family wouldn't double check when I told them, like, oh, I ate with friends. And I told my friends I ate with my family. Like, no one was cross-referencing, right? So, like, restriction could easily increase or I could be running on the track and no one would, you know, put two and two together, which was a little bit unfortunate now. It would have been probably more easily caught. But for me at the time, you know, it served the purpose of feeling like I was really taking good steps toward what I could do to change myself. So even though I wasn't diagnosed in high school, uh, if I would self-diagnose, which you know is really highly recommended, um, I, I'm sure I certainly would have been uh, diagnosed with depression, uh, with anxiety, and with um, an eating disorder. Because the severity of symptoms by the time I had reached high, uh, senior year um, were to the level that it would have probably gotten the label, right? 
And so um, along with that, you know, I had been working at this self-improvement, at this change, at all of these external things for so long that um, a lot of times I felt pretty worthless. I felt pretty hopeless and helpless. And so by my senior year, actually I think it may have been junior, um, suicidal ideation started coming very frequently to mind because if my hand of cards was as it was and I was doing my best to change and it wasn't changing, what was the point? Along with hormonal shifts and all of that in adolescence, right? Like, and being so sensitive and feeling so much, oh, I was not interested. And so I made it to college though. I graduated high school and made it into college. And I just knew, right, in college, everything would change. <laughs> everything, right? Everything would be better. I was gonna be independent. It was just gonna be awesome, right? Because the problem then was that, well, I had to eat when my parents ate, we ate what they wanted. Like, I didn't have enough freedom, right? I wanted to be on my own, I wanted to be independent, and when I got to college, I got freedom, which actually didn't really help at all. It made things about 10 times worse. So I got to college, right? Here I am, so hopeful, and yet it goes <coughs> awry. My plan of continued improvement means that all of my symptoms continued to escalate, right? So I wasn't doing enough before, apparently, because I wasn't changing, so I started doing more. I started my symptoms, um, eating disorder symptoms switched from restriction more to binging and purging. Anything I could get my hands on um, was fair game for either binging and purging, and I just dove in because I had no other recourse, or so I thought. I didn't know any other ways of going about it. And in using symptoms, it gets to be a vicious cycle because there is that bit of relief, right? Like with self-harm or with eating disorder symptoms or drug and alcohol use or something like that, they're so difficult to break out of because there is that little break before the drop, right? Before the dread, before the depths of the despair set in after there is a little bit of reprieve. And so I kept chasing it, right? I kept chasing just that little ounce, that little ounce of peace. And it dug me in much, 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 much deeper. Thankfully though, at that time, um, I had gotten in so deep that um, a couple of my girlfriends, actually one of my roommates who lived with me, it was kind of unavoidable if you live with me 24 seven to notice that something was going on. Uh, she helped me walk to the counseling center. So the first time I ever got introduced to treatment officially was in college, and um, I was angry with her. I was really angry with her, but I knew she was doing something for me that I wouldn't do for myself at that point. And so I trusted her, and I went with her. And so in college, that was the first time I got introduced to traditional treatment with medication, nutrition, therapy, and um, a little non-traditional, not at the counseling center, but I also got introduced to yoga. So yoga in college, um, I, I started rather haphazardly. I wasn't so interested in going, but one of my friends was going. I was like, oh yeah, I don't really know what it is, but I'll go. And so I went, and it was the worst thing in the world. <laughs> I hated it. And I really can't describe to you the level of hatred that I had for yoga, but it was horrible. Um, I intended never, ever to go back in my entire life. Because what happened was that I had been spending most of my time here right? I was in my thoughts, I was in my emotions, and uh, I was not in here. I wasn't ever listening to if this was hungry, or if this was full, or if it was tired, or if my body was in pain. Like, I, no. Mm -mm. So when I was at yoga, though, what they didn't tell me prior to yoga class was that, oh, this is like an embodiment practice, right? This is an, a practice to connect to body, and uh, it's probably good that they didn't because I probably would have pieced out. But uh, I stayed and what happened was that all of this stuff was dredged up, right? When we would do hip openers, I would be livid. When we would do heart openers, right, I would be so tearful. We would do all of these different yoga postures, right, asanas, and all this emotion would be pulled up. I thought it was just because I was in the middle of you know, depression and an eating disorder and all of these things that all of this was coming up even more to the front. But what I learned later, right, is that there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of emotion that's stored in the body. 
And when we're young and we can't process it, right? We don't have the vocabulary, we don't have the emotional skills, we don't have maybe just the understanding. It, it hangs out in there until we're older and we can process it. So we'll come back to that a little bit later, but uh, my hatred. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't going back. It was the worst thing in the world. And so um, I did stick, though, with traditional methods. I stuck with therapy, I stuck with medication, I stuck with nutrition. And uh, that got me through a bit in college. Um, and the other thing that happened in college is that once I had my ground more underneath me, I got into a pretty committed relationship. However, let me backtrack for a moment and tell you that I was not interested at all from the beginning. However, my friend said, like, he's a really nice guy. He, Corinne, he's a really good guy. Like, he's so sweet. And you know what? Like, he really likes you. And I was like, oh, well, I'm okay. Like, I'll, I'll go out with him, you know? Even though, like, I knew, you know, that knowing, like, I knew. And so um, we dated, and then um, we'll fast forward for a minute, and then uh, two years later, after we had been in a relationship and he was talking about marriage, I was like, we need to break up. And right, some of you are laughing. You saw it coming. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate because I did too. I knew it, right? I knew from the beginning and I didn't really listen to it because I was listening to other people outside of me. And so uh, he was really saddened by it and I felt bad. <coughs> I didn't feel bad that I had listened to myself, right, and done what I knew I needed to do. I felt bad because I didn't listen to myself from the beginning. When my friends were like, he's a nice guy, I was like, yeah, he is, that's great. Do you want to go out with him? <laughs> so, um, where was I? Oh, relationship. So I ended it, right? And uh, when I ended it, I felt relieved. And the thing about relief is that it was reassuring for me that that wasn't right, right? The relief that came was like, ah, you made the right choice. And that was great. I graduated college. I graduated with my bachelor's degree in psychology, bachelor's degree in Spanish, and a concentration minor in women's studies because I couldn't sit still, right? If I sat still, I was gonna be in my body, and so I really had to not do that. And so um, I graduated. I took a little bit of time off in between undergrad and graduate school because when I was applying, applying to um, doctorate level programs, I started having panic attacks. Didn't know what they were until that. And I was like, this is so weird. I've never had a panic attack before. Why would I be panicking about applying to doctorate level programs? And then like this light bulb went off and was like, you don't want to go to a doctorate level program. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's helpful. Can you have just told me that to begin with? And so um, I, took the t I took time off, which was excellent. At the time, there were these strange things called paid internships, mm -hmm. which I don't know that they exist anymore, but they existed not that long ago, because I'm not super old. And um, it was awesome. I got to shadow a lot of providers from psychiatrists to social workers, uh, licensed uh, professional therapists, the whole gamut. And I decided then that I wanted to go into social work. So I, bless you. I applied to graduate school, and I went into um, a master's of social work program uh, with a clinical concentration so that I could do therapy, I could run groups, I could also do advocacy and awareness and things because uh, that was what interested me. So that was cool. But you know what happened was that two weeks into the program, I remember distinctly because I was like, I'm only two weeks into the program, which is two years long. I was like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> mm, no, this isn't quite right. However, what I had heard from other people is that I was college material. <laughs> that this would be a great path. What else am I going to do with a bachelor's in psychology and Spanish and women? Which is rather valid, right? Like you would need a master's to be able to do a little bit more comprehensive work. And I was like, well, okay, I'll stay. <laughs> so I stayed, I stayed in graduate school, and I did learn a lot in my program. Um, and in graduate school at this point, I was consistently in therapy. I was uh, progressing and I was actually enjoying it, which um, I didn't in the beginning. Um, 
and I had gotten into a relationship after I had been on my feet for a little bit. And this one was different. So this relationship that I got into, I liked most of the things about him. There were still some things that I was like, well, not like those characteristics about people that like we all kind of have. Like if you get hungry, you're kind of like a little intense, or at least I'm a little intense, or you know, like different stuff that's just like our quirks and things. Like there were just some fundamental things that I was like, well. But then I figured like, well, we all have those things, right? And so um, we were in a relationship and um, for the first time, I really felt intensely motivated to get better. And I was motivated to get better because he was so motivated for me. He was cheering me on and so supportive and so helpful that I was like, okay, right, I can do this. And so that was very helpful for me. However, um, I heard around that same time, right, that like, well, you, you can't get better for someone else, right? You, you can't do that, right? You have to get better for yourself. And I was like, well, <laughs> come on, I had that one thing going for me. Um, and so uh, I was a little frustrated with that at the time, but now in looking back and what I talk to clients about is that you can start getting better for your dog, right? You can start getting better for your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your mom or your dad. That does not matter. At some point, yeah, you'll get to the part where you do want to do it for you. But start wherever you are. It really is unimportant what your motivation is. It could be for your fish. Like, it, that doesn't matter, right? What matters is that you're doing the work. And I wish I had heard that from somebody because I had so much guilt. It's like, oh, I'm doing this for him and I'm not supposed to be doing it for him. And like, oh, this is difficult and awkward. And now, like, should I even do it at all? It just complicated things, right, instead of supporting it. So uh, you might be surprised to know that I was continuing in yoga at this point. I had a routine going now where I would go to yoga in the morning before the world awoke. And uh, I was in Philadelphia at the time, so um, I would walk to the yoga studio. The city was still asleep. I would go to yoga. Now, I will be totally honest and say that it wasn't totally to support myself. I was doing hot yoga, which was 90 minutes. It was very hot, very long and very difficult, and I still had the aspect of punishing myself, so like that fit in very well in that category. However, yoga kind of like pulled a fast one on me, and I would be in yoga, I'd be all angry, and all this emotion would be coming up, and I would still think I was doing it more for punishment out of, instead of self-care. And then I would leave the studio and walk outside, and something happened. I wish I could tell you the exact day, but I don't remember when it was. I just remember vividly that I said yoga got me because I walked outside and I noticed that there were trees in the sidewalks on the streets in Philly. And I say that, it sounds simple, right? But I had <coughs> never seen the trees before. And I was pretty sure that from the day before to that day, they hadn't like planted those trees overnight, right? There were trees in Philly and they had leaves on them, which I had never seen. And so I was noticing and observing things I hadn't ever seen before. And I had been going to that studio for a fair period of time. And I was walking down the street and I could feel the hustle and the bustle and all of the people, right, like bent on getting where they were going. And I was just there. I was in my routine, but I wasn't stressing of getting anywhere. I was calm. I felt centered. I remember someone running into me and knocking my shoulder, and usually I would have had like an angered response of wanting to like punch him in the face, but I didn't want to do that. I actually like blessed him, and I remember thinking like, what? Like, I, what is that even? Like, I, I don't even understand what's happening, because I was like, oh man, he must really be struggling to run into another human, not even recognize or say like, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, and to like keep going. And so I wished him well, and I was like, oh man, I hope, hope he has a good day, right? He must be really having a hard time. And I was like, that's not like me. I could smell the subway, not the subway sandwich shop, like the underground Philly subway. <laughs> I don't know if you know the underground Philly subway, but it has a smell. And normally I would say the smell is somewhere on like unpleasant to revolting, but I smelled it and it was just like, it was just a smell. 
Like it didn't have this connotation of positive or negative. And so I knew yoga had like got me. Not only yoga, right? Like all of the changes that I had made over the years of taking care of myself and prioritizing therapy or medication or nutrition or being open and vulnerable with my friends and being honest with them about what was going on. All of these things had supported me up until that moment when I felt like I was awake, like I was alive, like for the first time ever. I don't know if you've had that sensation or that experience, but it's absolutely amazing. And it's unforgettable to me to this day. It's still a very visceral experience. And so I was incredibly grateful for that because Never before had I had a glimpse to that degree of feeling so alive. So I graduated with my master's in social work, and I started working. I began working at an inpatient uh, hospital for mental health treatment, a uh, very high level of care. Again, convincing myself that I liked it. Oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is good. It's actually really great. Um, but I didn't really um, like the work there. And so um, within that time, I was offered um, by two of my superiors <coughs> to go out to Minnesota to be able to uh, bring up and support a struggling behavioral health treatment facility. They had worked with me. I was in like early management, early leadership, and. Um, they wanted me to go out. They appreciated my work ethic and had invited me, and I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I went out to Minnesota. I took a director's position and um, was working right under um, the woman who had brought me out, the COO, and I also knew the CEO who had uh, been part of in the invitation out. And so I felt incredibly privileged right, to be out there and to be coming out with my skill set to be able to assist them in making changes so that the clients at the facility could be better taken care of, staff could be better taken care of, right? everyone could really receive better treatment. But what I didn't know about going out there to improve this facility was that really it was just kind of like a, a flip. And I don't know if house flipping goes like this, but uh, they kind of clean house and stuff isn't necessarily cleaned up, and then like they, they leave. And so um, we were in the midst of all of those changes and things, and I would have direction from my boss to go in and bring up these certain things or do these certain things and change this and create that, and I would bring it all together and present it to her, and she'd be like, no. And I was like, Okay, what do you want me to do? I'll rework it, right? Take it back around. She'd give me direction. I'd take it back around, bring it back. She was like, no. And I wasn't understanding what she was saying. And so I was like, hey, like, this isn't working out very well for me. I'd like to do my job that I was hired to do because I like to do that. And um, she's like, just, just, you know, don't, don't worry about it. And I was like, what? She's like, just just do the job. And I was like, well, I'm trying, but you're not allowing me to. And so um, I didn't really understand what she was telling me, and so I went to the CEO, and I was like, hey, so I'd like to do more of my job, but I'm not getting a lot of guidance from my direct boss. What do you think? You know, can you help me? What's your perspective? And he's like, Corinne, look, like, just take the money. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. Right? Like I came out with this understanding in my head that I was there to serve and I was there to help and I was there to support and make things better for the people in the facility and I was trying to do that and it wasn't coming to fruition because all I was really supposed to do was look like I was doing my job and not do it. And ah, I don't know if it was the social worker stuff I got in my head when I was in school or just my heart or I don't know, but I couldn't just take the money which now I'm like, what was I doing? I'm just kidding. <laughs> like I, could, I couldn't do it. And so I was like, I, I can't. And so I asked my boss, I said, hey, you know, like I'm not happy with this. I'd like to take leave. I had found, get ready, at this point, a yoga teacher training that I wanted to do. <laughs> I asked her if I could take leave and she's like, yeah, yeah, you know what, you can take leave. And I was like, great. I applied to the training, I had everything sent in, and uh, she comes back around and she's like, oh, Corinne, you know, I know I told you you could go, but you can't. And I was like, what? <laughs> Many tears and much anger, and uh, I was like, I quit. And uh, I was really proud of myself because I knew that my taking leave was just kind of my, like, one step to 
oh, I'm not coming back. And uh, she just made it a shorter process for me. I was afraid. I was very afraid of how I would support myself, right? Here I am going for three months of teacher training and hoping for the best. And uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I was really worried. But I knew I had to do it. And I did. I went to yoga teacher training. Amazing. Even more stuff got dredged up, which I seem to have somehow forgotten about from all my yoga classes before. But it kept clearing <coughs> me out, right? All of the stuff kept coming up and kept moving out. And um, I was definitely getting much stronger. And so I came home. And uh, I accepted a job as a yoga teacher. And then I got a little scared again, so I applied to some backup jobs. <laughs> I applied um, at an eating disorder treatment facility as admissions team leader, um, something that obviously is very near and dear to my heart for eating disorders and helping girls and women. And uh, I got the job. And I was like, oh, benefits, nine to five schedule, consistency, a class or so a week, no benefits. I don't know. And so I told them I couldn't do yoga teacher training and I took the safe bet. <laughs> Did you see that coming? Um, and so I was actually really excited though. I felt bad in committing to the position and not doing it, but I felt more excited about doing this position um, and in, as an admissions team leader. And so I got into the facility, and now in therapy, it was like enjoyable, and I was making sure I had my I's dotted and my T's crossed so that when I was working with people, my stuff wasn't coming up, right? It wasn't impacting my relationship and my guidance with them. So in session one time, I'll give you a good example that I very clearly remember. I'm a, I was doing an evaluation for someone for a level of care. So did they need residential, day treatment, intensive outpatient, outpatient, that sort of thing. and. Uh, she, uh, my grandmom had just passed, my maternal grandmom had passed away, and um, turns out that her grandmom had just passed away also. And so my inclination before that comment came out of her mouth was that she needed residential treatment. However, after that comment came out of her mouth, it was like, oh, she needs to be with her family. She, <coughs> she can't be in residential treatment. But because I had done enough work on myself, I saw oh, Corinne, this isn't about her. She needs residential treatment, right? This is about your perspective of being with family. And so I stuck with my recommendation, but because I had had enough work done for myself, right, I was able to keep that separated. And so for me, continuing in therapy um, was very helpful to make sure that I was appropriately taking care of those that I was taking care of and myself. So about um, two and a half years into the position, um, the same boyfriend that had been around from before, uh, he and I had been talking about marriage because after a certain point, like, what else are you going to do, right? Are we just going to hang out forever together, you know? So, um, so we were having the conversation, and uh, we started fighting a lot. And there were just so many things about him that I really just despised. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, this just feels terrible. He was on the same page. He's like, oh, yeah, you and all your stuff. And I was like, I know. <laughs> and so we broke up. This one was a little bit more amicable than the first one. But I remember thinking, like, ah, I did it again. I knew from the beginning. And he was a nice guy and all that, you know, but I knew. And so this one didn't come with, with as much pain or with as much guilt as the first one because there were more favorable characteristics. <laughs> um, but we, we parted ways, and uh, I continued in my position. And, but uh, about two and a half years in, I was getting bored. Um, I felt like, you know, like I could kind of run the show, and I actually had been when my boss um, was out of her position for a while. And so I was like, you know, I kind of need something new. So I asked them about um, a promotion, and uh, I got the promotion to um, a New Jersey location. So I transplanted myself from Pennsylvania. I came across the border to New Jersey <coughs> and started working um, as a site director in the facility there, which was amazing. I had a whole team beneath me. I had upper management above me. And I was kind of in the middle, which I didn't realize initially all of what that meant. <laughs> so I was supporting right my uh, staff to support our clients. And then I was also reporting up, right, to make sure that we were meeting objectives, we were 
making budget, right? We were making money, we were meeting expectation if not exceeding them. But the difficult thing about it is that when you can see the front lines, but you also see the bottom line essentially, right, with the dollar sign, um, trying to manage both of those can be difficult in a for-profit company. And so my goal was the same as it had been when I lived in Minnesota, and I wanted to take better care of the staff so the staff could take better care of the clients so the clients could do better. Um, it didn't change when I was here. And so being in leadership, right, I was like, oh, I got this, right? I can advocate for what we need. I can clearly see it. I have metrics to support it. I know all the numbers to validate it. And so I presented it to upper management. I said, hey, like this is what we need to do better care, right? We could even make more money eventually if we're providing better quality services. All proud of myself because my notion was, oh, well, this squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And so um, presented it all up and they were like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 okay. And then time went on and nothing changed. And I was like, oh, hey, we're struggling more, right? We need other things. We need these things to change. And they were like, oh, yeah, 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 OK. And so my plan didn't go as I had imagined. And eventually, instead of getting what I had hoped for for our team, I got myself written up because I was no longer in line with what the expectations were, which I guess was just doing the job and getting through. And so eventually, about two and a half years in, again, there seems to be significance to that timing, uh, I got fired. Now, for me, getting fired this time, um, it came with a little bit of a disappointment because like, I wanted it to be something that it wasn't, and yet uh, there was also a little bit of a relief to it. I knew I was fighting a lose-lose battle eventually as I was going up and advocating and asking for these things, and it just wasn't happening. So. It was a blessing, right, in disguise at the time, but I didn't really know what to do with myself. So um, I was hanging out, trying to figure out what was going on, and uh, I was like, oh, well, I know when I worked in Mount Laurel, right, that uh, when we would refer clients south for services, for outpatient or something like that, there's next to nothing here. And so um, I figured, like, you know what, I can go into private practice and work for myself. <laughs> and then I can take care of clients the way I want to take care of clients, right? I have no one to report up to and I provide the services as I think is appropriate. And so I uh, started private practice. And I was working with clients with eating disorders, with depression, with anxiety, and um, really appreciating the work because I had been in those spaces, right? I had been in similar situations and I could see a different side of it than I could when I was in it. And for me, I like to be able to provide that to people because when I was in therapy, that wasn't the notion that I got from my providers, right? The very first provider that I had seen was like, oh, well, <coughs> you're gonna have to deal with this forever. Like this is something that like, you'll have to like monitor for the rest of your life. And I was like, oh, that sounds horrible. And when suicidal ideation would come on their radar early in treatment and services right in college, I was like, well, if I'm going to have to deal with this forever, why would I do that? Because that sounds miserable. To me, that sounded terrible. It was like constantly like lurking over my shoulder. I had to keep like a watchful eye and be hyper vigilant like the rest of my life. Like, I don't know. No, thank you. And so for me to be able to tell people like, look, I don't have eating disorder thoughts anymore, right? They don't go through my mind. Body image things do not arise. There may be those days, right, where it's like, huh, I don't like how clothes fit, right? But like, it's not like it was when it was all consuming and that was all that went through my mind. Those thoughts have changed and changing my thoughts is really life changing. So for me in private practice, I like to be that one person that might be the only one that says, hey, recovery is possible, right? Because you are not an anomaly, right? Your brain functions probably fairly similar to what my brain functions like, right? Like you have feelings, like I have feelings. You can manage this and then cope with it, right? And then not need to manage and not need to cope with those specific things, but be able to do self-care things, right, just to maintain. But it's not the same as coping and managing, right? Because that's just trying to keep symptoms abated a bit. So 
for most people, that seems like it's like brand new information, which is unfortunate. It's a shame. It needs to be more publicly discussed, I think. So I like to be able to have a platform like this or to be the person in private practice you know, that's communicating that. Um, so that's something that I really appreciate about my job now. And so in my job, although I bring in traditional methods, I also bring in meditation, mindfulness, yoga, breathing, because all of that for me, as you've heard a bit of, has been very impactful. And so if we can put it all together, why wouldn't I, right? If I can help people and assist them in understanding themselves and how to take care of themselves a bit better. So one thing that I've also noticed is that a lot of my clients are a lot like me. A lot of them feel a lot. Right? They're very sensitive, they're very perceptive, they're very aware, they're very intuitive. And so um, when we resonate on that level, it's very reassuring for them because a lot of times people don't validate that in life, right? Like I didn't get it really for most of my life. And so um, now I have friends right, and family who support that. And I can be maybe that one person for my client who's like, oh yeah, you feel a lot, like it's cool. <laughs> Let's teach you how to better feel so you can manage a little bit better. And then after managing, we can help you really recover, right? That you don't even have to worry about managing. You can just be cool and just do your self-care stuff, right? So it's awesome. So uh, when I, I don't know when it was, but um, a little bit into private practice, I came across the word an empath again. And I don't know if you're familiar with the word empath, but it resonated a lot for me because I was like, oh my gosh, I have a definition. There is a way that describes me that I never heard before. And so an empath, right, is someone who can feel something that someone else is not willing to feel. And so I understood that for me in my life, a lot of times when I would walk up to my friend, right, and I would ask her like, oh, hey, how are you? And she was like, oh, I'm good, but I felt really sad. I was like, that doesn't match, right? I understood like, oh, that makes sense, right? But I didn't have any understanding of the word before. Because emotions, right, they have energy. Because if we get like metaphysical for a second, right, like my body is made up of the same thing as the water in my bottle, right, the yoga mat, the floor, the air that we're breathing. <coughs> if we just change the molecular structure, right, it'll be something else. Right, so like all of our body is atoms, right? Just as is everything else that we've got going on, right? So emotions are supposed to be energy in motion. Like if you have any toddlers in your life, right? They might get upset over something, right? And be comforted and then a few moments later, right? They're off doing their same thing that they were doing before, like nothing ever happened, right? Like it moves through them. They allow the experience, it moves, it changes and they move on. And that's really ideally how we would be functioning as adults. And I don't mean to say that, you know, if we were angry right now, we'd be like tantruming and like screaming on the floor, but that we'd be managing it a little bit differently, but allowing it to flow through us. Because you know, like when you're angry, like you might get really hot or like, like tense, right? Or if there's anxiety, right? Like it's kind of like this moody, like jittery, like busy kind of energy right through the body or if there's sadness or depression, right? Like it's heavy, right? It is really, really heavy. So it has an energy to it, right? It has an essence to the emotion. And so um, when there is an emotional experience that happens, there's uh, a thought, right, in the mind. Like, uh, so if someone said, oh, Corinne, why'd you wear that sweater today? It's ugly, right? If I had a shred of insecurity about my sweater, it would hit me, right? I would be triggered and I'd be like, oh, she criticized my sweater, right? But if I love this sweater, which I do, um, anyone could say anything about it, right? And it would be like water off a duck's back. It would just whoop, right? Like roll right off and it wouldn't hit me at all. So when we get triggered, right? The word trigger, oh, it's really gotten a bad rap. But when we get triggered, what's happening is that that emotion that is stored somewhere in our body, right, maybe from past childhood stuff or who knows what, right, the why doesn't really matter. But when we get triggered, right, if she makes that comment and I have some shred of insecurity about body confidence or my attire or something like that, that emotion is coming up. So when we say like, oh, I feel mad that she said that, right, the thought is up here, 
the emotion, mad, right, the label, but there's a feeling of mad in the body, right? That's what I was dredging up all those yoga classes when anger was pouring out of me, right? It was in different parts in the body. And yoga teachers will say things like, the issues are in the tissues, right? Like, it's like a phrase that they have. Um, because there are places in the body where emotion is stored. So you can go through life, right, and actually be given all of these wonderful gifts of being triggered, right? Where people say things and there's something coming up in you that if you really felt it and if you really explored it, it could heal. But usually we just get mad at the other person, right? And they're like, oh, if she weren't such a jerk and criticizing my sweater, I'd be fine. But it's not her, right? It's the fact that I have that insecurity within me, that I have that pain, that I have that undealt with emotion. Does that make sense? Okay. So we can go through life, right, with all of these opportunities for life to trigger us and life to bring up our stuff. Or we can kind of voluntarily, right, subject ourselves to it in yoga or something like that, right? Like a bodily movement that will arise these things up and bring them to the surface that we can allow them out. So um, what I would like to do, we're going to go through a little bit of an experiential exercise. Um, but before that, I just want to round out with a couple of things. So um, yeah, we'll do that next. So the mind, right, it's not the enemy. A lot of times people will think like, oh, my thoughts, they're the problem, right? If I could just stop thinking, that would be great. However, that's the mind's job. The mind is supposed to think it is survivalistic, it is evolutionarily advantage to think. Because way back when, right, if we walked past a cave and our buddy was killed, we would need to remember that the bear lives there so that we don't end up dying, right? It's very much survivalistic. And if you'll, um, I don't know if this will resonate for you, but I very much have liked in the past pro-con lists, <laughs> right? I could pro-con all day for everything. And um, sometimes it wouldn't work, right? There would be so many things on the cons list, like, oh, this is totally not for you. Like, do not do this. But I'd be like, oh, but actually, like now that I pro con list, I wanted the pro. So I realized it's not adding up, but uh, right? So I knew what I really wanted. And what that told me too is that my thoughts were not capable of making these decisions, right? My thoughts were just weighing out essentially, are you gonna die in this scenario or not? Right, and death to us now looks very different than it may have when we were trying to survive famine and drought and things like that. But death now could be something like social ostracization. That's a word, right? It is now. Um, right, like where we are excluded from our groups, right? That feels like a death. And so the brain isn't equipped. Do you know what is equipped, really, to truly make these decisions? I hear the body. There's a very specific part of the body. Your heart. Yes, correct, you get a gold star. <laughs> the heart, <clears throat> and the heart is in the body, in case you didn't know, which I think, <laughs> I'm hoping by this point you did, right? But in order to connect to the heart, we have to connect to the body. And so in order to connect to the body, we have to get out of the head. And so it's a little bit interconnected, but in a good way. Right, because remember all of those instances where I told you, like, I knew, right? Like, I knew, but sometimes I didn't listen to it. Sometimes I did, but it was maybe still late in the game. Like, my knowing, it wasn't a thought, right? It wasn't a cognitive, like, oh, this is a fact. This is a thing that I know, right? It was a visceral, it was a bodily knowing that must have come from my heart because it wasn't in my head. Right, all signs may have pointed go, and I would have been like, ah, it's not a go. So it was in here. And so um, two other points. One um, that I forgot to mention, but is very significant, is that when I got my um, site director position that I later got fired from, um, I had been out doing presentations in the community as the new site director, talking about eating disorders and talking about our services. 
you know what happened? I met this guy, and immediately, oh, I was drawn to him. And we chatted for like five minutes. We had a very short period of time to chat before I was supposed to do some speaking, and I wanted to know everything about him, everything about his life. I wanted to understand everything and the stuff that he told me about. I was immediately enthralled with, like I loved all of it. And there weren't any other qualifiers like there were with other people or with my other relationships in the past. It was so cool. I was like, this exists? It exists where there's no like, oh, I don't really like that. It was like across the board. And we got engaged, so that's really cool. <laughs> The other piece that I wanted to tell you is that there seems to be a two and a half year cycle, right, where things have been changing. And although sometimes I may have perceived it a bit negatively in my past, I've understood that it is every time bringing me more closer to who I really am. Every time these things change and this flows, I come more into me, if that makes sense, right? I'm living more from my heart every time these situations change. And so I have been in private practice now about two and a half years. So we shall see. <laughs> so we're going to um, transition to the first kind of experiential exercise. So ideally, I'm going to walk you through, as I walk my clients through, one activity. But instead of it being so much of an exchange, right, because normally I would be having you talk to me and tell me what's going on for you, we're not going to do that. You're just going to verbally, or I'm going to verbally ask you the questions, and you're just going to answer them silently in your head. So there's no out loud conversational portion of this except on my end. So I'd like for you, if you're feeling a little sleepy because we're going to close our eyes, just move your body around a little bit, right, like kind of loosen up and make sure that it's awake enough that it's not going to fall asleep. And then, once you've done any shifting and adjusting and rearranging, find a comfortable place to sit. A comfortable way, comfortable means. If you want to back up against a wall so your back's supported, however is ideally comfortable. We're not going to be sitting too terribly long, but it's important for the body to be comfortable. And so if you're already in a seated, comfortable position, if you're comfortable with closing your eyes, I'm going to encourage you to do that. If you're not comfortable with closing your eyes, just leave them open. But I would recommend, if you're leaving them open, just focus a bit on the floor in front of you so that whatever you're looking at is not moving. Because ideally, we'd want a little less stimuli going on. So ideally, it's not me, because I'm probably not going to sit still. Um, but just something that's pretty solid. And so the purpose of this exercise, um, I call it feeling feelings. So um, that's a starter title, is to get into the body a little bit. But I'm not interested in evoking high levels of emotion, right? We're not really delving in there. There's usually something always kind of on the surface in the body. So we're just going to do a bit of a body scan. And I'm going to walk you through it. So if you're comfortable with closing your eyes, go ahead and do that. It's a little bit easier to tune in when the eyes are closed because there's less internal input, right? The eyes are kind of the easiest sense to cut off because we can simply close them. The <coughs> nose, right, or sense of touch, that might be a little bit more difficult. So if you're comfortable with your eyes closed, great. If not, just focusing your eyes softly. And we're going to look through the body, right? So we're taking our mind's eye and we're doing an internal body scan. So before we start the scan, just take a breath in nose and fill up the throat, chest, lungs, belly, and deep into like that low abdominal belly. And then exhaling slowly and inhaling a second time, just breathing gently and calmly in and slowly out. 
noticing your connection to whatever's supporting you, if it's the floor, if it's blankets, a bolster, a chair. You are grounded. And then we're going to tune into the body. So we're going to start at the top of the head. And we're looking internally, so it's not like you're observing yourself from the outside, but we're going to scan down. So as you're scanning down, you're looking for those types of sensations that come up with emotion. right? Sometimes there's pressure in the head or at the temples, pain behind the eyes, the lump in the throat, maybe tightness in the chest. There's pits that come up in the stomach. Maybe that tingly, anxious kind of sensation in the hands or down the arms or in the feet. Just noticing what is there. And if nothing comes on the radar, you're going to do exactly the same thing as if there is something on the radar. So what we're going to do, we're going to keep our focus on that sensation that comes up. And we're going to breathe in the nose and imagine that the breath goes right to that spot. And the breath that we breathe in is calm and it's neutral. The breath is always calm and it is always neutral. And so when the breath comes in, it surrounds whatever that feeling is that we've identified, like a big warm blanket. And not only does the breath surround it, but the breath is also able to permeate it because breath is lighter than any of the sensations that we've been able to identify in the body. So it permeates it, it goes around it, it envelops it. And the breath is calm and it's neutral. And so because it is so light, the breath is able to shift and to change whatever sensation is being noticed. Sometimes things just start to kind of evaporate. They kind of start to disappear. They might drift off like clouds. Sometimes they even melt like ice. No change is necessary, right? We're not forcing the feeling out. We're not telling it with a breath, you have to go. We're just gently inviting it with a calm, neutral breath for it to change if it wants to. And so keeping your focus on that spot that you identified, just now evaluate if it's changed at all. Has it dissipated? Or maybe its intensity has lessened. Maybe the size of it has shrunk. Maybe the pain isn't as prominent. See what you notice about the shift, if any. Still breathing in through the nose, the calm and neutral breath comes in and fills up that space. It allows it to change. Gently, not forcefully. So whether or not there has been change is okay. The next breath in through the nose not only goes to that place that you've identified, but it fills the whole body. So top of the head, down to the chest and collarbones, and down the arms, all the way to the fingertips. Imagine it filling from the hips, down the legs, all the way to the feet. And with the next breath in, it almost fills up the body so much with this calm and neutral energy that it expands out the toes and the fingertips. And if it doesn't feel like it's expanding, that's okay. Just the intention of bringing it in is enough to shift our state. And so in your own time, at your own rate, just taking in five more breaths that are calm and neutral, filling up the whole body, or maybe still specifically focusing on that place you've identified. And at the end of your fifth breath, taking your own time, you can just gently blink your eyes open if they're closed. Or just look up toward me if they're open.
The room got a lot more calm. Did you feel it? That was cool. So we're going to transition now. My mic is going to be changed. The video is going to be off. We are going to be getting situated for yoga. So if you have mats, great. If you don't, it's no problem. The floor is totally suitable. And um, we'll get the chairs moved and we'll get ourselves arranged. Um, let's do it.